So our first speaker is going to be Marcy Hamilton. She is the Chief Executive Officer and Academic Director at Child USA, an interdisciplinary think tank to prevent child abuse and neglect. She is also a scholar of constitutional law and a Fox Family Pavilion Distinguished Scholar in the Fox Leadership Program at the University of Pennsylvania. Thank you for being here tonight, Marcy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for both this refreshing gathering. As someone who teaches constitutional law, I wish my students were here to watch it in process. This is how the law gets made. Um, but I, I'm here tonight to focus on the window constitutional amendment. And the bottom line is this. The victims, the advocates, and their families have been dragged through Pennsylvania politics since 2005, while the rest of the country is passing windows. First, it was delay. Then it was, oh, we forgot to publicize it. And now it is wrapping it up in incredibly divisive politics which has led Democrats to not even vote for the window the way it's being presented now because the divisiveness is so clear. So what I'd like to do uh, in the time I've been allotted is to explain the reasoning for why everyone in Harrisburg needs to drop this constitutional amendment and do what we should have done years ago, over a decade ago, and pass a statute that gives victims access to justice. Amen. So I'd just like to explain what's been going on in the rest of the country. Uh, Child USA is the only organization that tracks and uh, works on statutes of limitations in the country. We track all 50 states. We now have a global arm and are tracking um, the SOLs around the globe. So in 2005, the Philadelphia Grand Jury Report, which I had the honor of working on with uh, uh, the uh, DA, Lynn Abraham, recommended for the first time a window. That window did not find itself into a bill, but the idea was out there. In 2011, uh, finally the first bill was introduced, and there's been a bill introduced in every two-year session since then. So we're talking uh, 2005 to 2023, that's 18 years. The tragedy is that in 18 years, we have lost survivors through the disappointment of not getting anything passed and through the inability to deal with the fact that they could not get justice. So I view this current situation as an emergency, as someone who speaks to survivors every day, and um, let me just explain to you what states have been doing while Pennsylvania has unfortunately been dithering. Uh, we have revival statutes. We have windows from 24 states and uh, three territories. Connecticut, California, Delaware, Oregon, Guam, Hawaii, three times. Minnesota, Massachusetts, Georgia, Utah, Michigan, Arizona, Montana, New Jersey, New York, North Carolina, Vermont again, Washington, D.C., West Virginia, Kentucky, Arkansas, Nevada, Maine, Colorado, the Northern Mariana Islands. All of them have passed a statute and enacted a window that opened access to justice. One of the issues about a window is that it frequently gets lost, that this is about the survivors, but it is just um, as much about the, the full public. So how do windows operate? We study them in every state where they open. We have statistics. We can tell you how they operate. The first thing they do is they identify the hidden child predators at work right now on some child in this state. Once the window opens, you are immediately going to learn about drama teachers, coaches, other clergy. You're going to learn about them, and you're going to learn which of your young children are currently being sexually abused in the Commonwealth. 
The second thing that a window does is it shifts the cost of the abuse from the victim who over the course of their life could have a cost to them of up to $850,000 just from being traumatized as a child. You shift that cost from the victim to the ones who caused it. It's just fair. The third thing that it does, and this is where the public needs this legislation every bit as much as every survivor, this is how the public learns the truth. This is how the public learns how institutions endanger children. This is how parents learn how vulnerable their children are. This is how we learn what must be done to protect our children. If you take that public interest and think about it, every parent in the state should be calling you and asking for this legislation. It's about their kids right now. And what we're dealing with right now in this arena around the country is those who are responsible for the sexual abuse of children in organizational settings around the country, their favorite line is, it's in the past. It's not going to happen again. We're doing so much better. I can tell you for a fact, with all due respect to the fact we're at St. Joe's, where my husband graduated, but I can tell you for a fact, because we studied every archdiocese in the United States, that not one has a safety standard that is protective of children adequately. The highest score any of them got was 40 out of a possible 100, and they're all over the map. For anyone who thinks that the Catholic dioceses are uniform, you're very much misinformed. They are all fiefdoms in which the levels of protection range all over the map. And for those parents who are currently sending their children, their young children to Catholic schools, they really deserve a window so they can do the right thing by their children. They are the ones who need to be responsible. So what's been going on while the other states have been busy? Oh, and by the way, there are 15 window bills proposed this year, this, this month. We expect to see action, serious action, Massachusetts, Michigan, Maryland, uh, and Nebraska, and Kansas. The, um, so what's been happening? First, there was delay, right? 2005, it took six years to get the first bill introduced, and then it just didn't pass. It was introduced. There were passionate supporters, uh, Mark Rossi leading the way. Uh, there were survivors. There were the McAleese. Macklemales, the Basilich, I mean, all of these wonderful people were out there demanding it, and it just didn't happen. So then there is this bogus argument that it's unconstitutional to have a window. And for those who don't know how this game works, whenever the insurance industry gets backed into a corner on a window or the bishops, all of a sudden their favorite argument is, oh, it's unconstitutional. Right? We, everybody may think it's good policy, but we're telling you it's unconstitutional. This is the only state that fell for it. It's, it's, I mean, it's insane. Uh, so, so we've got delay. Then, it, you know, constitutional amendments should be hard to pass. They shouldn't be ordinary. So they're hard to pass. And so the first attempt, we get both, both years, both houses voting, and a screw-up. Uh, by the Secretary of State. Okay, so then we're told we've got to go back to another amendment, and with that amendment, we now have delay and insult on top of everything else, because now the victims are told, well, your, your issue doesn't stand on its own. We didn't really make all those promises to you for the last five years. Instead, here, have some really divisive issues, and we will play games with your justice. When you do that twice to a constitutional amendment, my view is dump it and let's just pass the statute. It's just a statute. Both Josh Shapiro's office when he was attorney general and I as a constitutional law lawyer have drafted and explained over and over that a window is not unconstitutional in the state. 
My organization defends windows in every state in the country. We have one in New Jersey, New York, California, Nevada. This is what we do. It's not unconstitutional. So there's nothing holding back good people in our state legislature from finally finding the rules you need to start up again and then please pass a statute, let the victims be free, and let's start letting the parents know where their children are at risk. Thank you. Thank you, Marcy.